Hi, this is Bill Hartzer, and this is SEO in 2023. Bill, what's your number one SEO tip for 2023? I think what we, as SEOs, we tend to get too involved in thinking about creating more content, creating more pages, and in optimize, optimizing our pages. I think my number one SEO tip for 2023 is that we need to actually sit down and carve out time in our schedules to clean up our websites. And that, you know, that can be from, mean a lot of things. It can, you know, it can be Things like uh, optimizing current images on the site so that they load faster. It can be just basically cleaning up widgets or any kind of extra content in the theme of our website or or templates of our website. And it can also mean, you know, looking back at, you know, overall what content is getting indexed and what content is not getting indexed. For example, there are a lot of large websites that allow their internal search pages to get indexed, crawled and indexed. And that kind of goes along with, okay, well, do you know, do you really need all this extra thin content on your website? And so that's kind of the overall theme is that, you know, we're so as SEOs, we want to optimize our pages. We want to get more links. We want to get, you know, you want to uh, create more content, but what about the content that you have there now? And, you know, a perfect example is I went back last week and spent two hours just going through my current website and updating some titles of the pages, updating, uh, adding some FAQs, things like that, that are just more cleanup tasks and of the current pages. And like I said, there's um, there's so much more to clean up, but let's pay attention in 2023 to make our current websites the best they can be in all aspects. And we don't necessarily have to spend all this time creating new content. Yeah, I think many SEOs don't do that or don't focus enough time on that, partly because maybe it's not as exciting as some other SEO activity, and partly because maybe they don't even know where to start. There's just so much that can be done, should be done. One of the things that you mentioned there was to look at what pages were indexed and and not indexed. Is that a good place to to start for this cleanup exercise to actually establish it? Yes, actually, that's probably a good place to start. I mean, there's, you know, you may have uh, blog posts or maybe articles or maybe, you know, content. And generally, this would be for, you know, sites that probably are not e-commerce websites. You know, e-commerce sites tend to have less content and, and more focused on the on the products and, and so forth. You know, some e-commerce sites do have extensive blogs and article content. And so that would be also. But, you know, it is, it, I have seen uh, several different ways to look at search console data and look at various data. And there are some tools out there that allow you to actually see which pages are actually indexed and which are not. We started looking at, you know, uh, Search Console and and looking at, you know, pages like, you know, the coverage reports and and so forth. We can see which pages are crawled but not indexed. And so there's things like that that is a good place to kind of start. And in fact, there's some reason why, you know, it's it's not indexed. And, And sometimes, uh, pages just get dropped out of the index for no apparent reason. And so going back, if it's an important page to you, um, going back and just refreshing the page and kind of t- an article or blog post that r- was written two, year, two, three, four or five years ago, maybe still relevant as, you know, as evergreen content and just kind of updating and refreshing it um, and just resubmitting it can actually make it Rank, you know, Google already knows about it, but it's just a matter of refreshing it. And so you can actually, you know, get it back in the index and so forth. So that's kind of part of the the cleanup process. But why will Google actually de-index a page that's got decent content on it? It could be decent content that was written, as you say, four or five years ago. Is it because maybe the internal links aren't um, 
directly from the homepage or significant pages in your site anymore and it just it's not getting that deemed authority from from your own site that's one area i mean we honestly we really don't know why certain pages just get dropped could be eternal links it could be less clicks from search results i've also seen just random pages sometimes just a hiccup in 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 google's crawling and indexing process that it just for some reason a page that and What's interesting is is that if it's a page that you can just literally go in and change one thing on the page um, or change some grammar on the page and, and resubmit it, and literally within five minutes or 10 or 15 minutes that page is indexed again, then it may not be a sign of the quality of the page. It may be the fact that just for some reason Google just happened to drop it. It's there's, you know, it. I'd like to spend more time investigating, you know, that um, there are some areas where, uh, you know, crawled pages that are not indexed. Sure, if you have, you know, ten, uh, I know a site that has 10,000 pages and they're very similar. Um, they have unique content, but they are very similar. And so you can kind of suspect that you know, and kind of figure out why, the, you know, some of those pages are not indexed. But there are these cases where certain just pages are not indexed. Yeah. And one thing you mentioned, of course, was the click-through rate from yes. search results as well. And it could be as simple as updating your titles if it's not deemed as, as relevant as other pages are nowadays. Yes, I've had a lot of good success in kind of really going back, you know, technically and crawling sites and, and figuring out kind of, what, you know, if there is a reason why certain pages, uh, you know, pruning pages... Analytics comes into that play too. I mean, if you know, it comes into if you have a list of URLs and there hasn't been any traffic clicks to that page in in a year or two years, then you kind of need to you know determine why. Is it because it's not indexed anymore, or is it because really it's just not relevant content anymore? And something else that you mentioned as well is thin content. And that, that, that can be an obvious reason why Google perceive that a page just as it doesn't add any value to users. So how much content is thin content nowadays? Is it a certain number of words? Does it just not answering a question sufficiently enough? You know, it's, there are, when you come to thin content, there's, there could be a, a, very, a page that ranks very well, that's very appropriate, that has 100 words on it. And if that answers the question, if that is, answers the question for the user, then that's, that's great. But, the, you know, I like to look, at du, you know, look for duplicate content issues. Whereas, you know, the classic example is that uh, when you have a blog, I mean, you make a blog post and you don't use the, what we call the more tag, which splits basically the first paragraph and whereas the thousand words of the blog post only appear on the blog post URL. And if you don't use that more tag, this, you know, split off the first paragraph as in, you know, where so that only the first paragraph appears on the slash blog, the main slash blog page, then literally you can have a situation where you have all the content on the slot on the blog URL and all the content on the on the slash blog, you know, main blog page. And, you know, obviously that's duplicate, you know, you have the same content in two places. That can run into, uh, you know, what we talk about classic duplicate content issues and cleaning that up. And so that can, you know, that can lead to essentially, th you know, thin content. There's a correlation, you know, there between, you know, thin content and duplicate content. It, it really is um, very close, you know, what in pages that I would remove. And talking about blogs, earlier on, uh, you referred to widgets. So how can you tell if you've got widgets on your blog, uh, if they're having a really detrimental impact on user experience and perhaps even search engine's perception of your site? Yeah, I mean, the you know, a good example of that is um, I came across a site that I had created, uh, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, and um, it still had, you know, traffic and so forth. But there was a widget that it, that pulled data or pulled information from another site. And obviously that site had gone down and now you have a widget that, you know, when the page loads, it, that widget is there, but it's a like a black rectangle or a, a blank rectangle, you know, of information. And so, you, you know, things like that, you know, something that's supposed to load 
information in the sidebar or something or in the footer or you know maybe it's pulling a logo from some other site um, like a an award or a something like that an image I remember years ago, kind of widgets were probably even more popular in blogs then. And you'll, you'll probably rem- remember this one. Do you remember my blog log? That was yes. a widget that contained kind of lots of other blogs and uh, kind of bloggers. And I think it was a way of swapping links as well. Yes, definitely. It could be other code, um, you know, stat counter code or any other code. And that's kind of the other lines of the cleanup. But also something that I really do think that is necessary that does make a difference is who you're linking out to. So you use something, you know, use a crawler and a crawler will go and it will crawl all the internal pages on the site. But then you are actually, you know, you could on a on an old page or on a page, you could be linking out to another URL. So in fact, for example, uh, most sites now are HTTPS. So if you could scroll through all the external, a list of external links and everybody you're linking out to, um, and you see an HTTP URL, especially, you know, HTTP colon slash slash YouTube.com. Um, every, you know, all those main sites are now HTTPS. And so you're linking out to a URL that's either 404 or you're linking out to a URL that is a 301. Now, on the flip side, one, you know, there's a link building tactic is to crawl your competitors Crawl your comp- you know, crawl your competitor's website and find everybody that they're linking out to. And I bet in a most larger, you know, 500 page or more sites, you'll find that they're linking out to a probably a link to a domain name that's not registered anymore. So, you know, the, uh, what I have seen is I have seen people register that domain name and then get the link back. And now, now the site is linking, you know, now their competitor is linking to them. So there's different, you know, that could happen. You could do, you know, that could be done to their competitors or your competitor, you could, your competitor could be doing it to you. Whereas you're linking out to a domain name that doesn't exist anymore. And your competitor then buys the domain name and uh, get some of the traffic or get some of that. This is, you know, that's one area that who you're linking out to is important to take a look at and, and clean up. Love it. A lot of great advice there. Love the advice about just crawling and seeing what your external links were linking to. And if they were coming up with errors or coming up as redirects, then look at them and perhaps get rid of them, change them to something else or change the copy. Um, and I'm sure by doing that across your, your own site, you'll increase the perceived authority value that your site is offering in the eyes of Google. Bill, you, you've shared a lot of um Great advice there. A lot of um, great advice of what SEO should be doing in 2023. But now let's talk about what SEO shouldn't be doing. So what's something that's seductive in terms of time, but ultimately counterproductive? What's something that SEO shouldn't be doing in 2023? Yeah, I think there's, um, you know, when we think about there's uh, a content. There are the past while, you know, it's been, re- you know, very fairly recently that we've been thinking and, uh, you know, probably using, you know, and thinking about AI and machine learning and, you know, AI generated content. We have everything now, you know, we can put in a list of keywords and and generate all these articles and content and so forth. You know, there's different tools that, you know, have different who that do better generating AI generated content. But at some point, I do believe that it's a race game that, you know, between Google and the SEOs that, okay, SEOs generate the AI content. Well, how long will it be until Google... Um, really fully understands, um, you know, that this is that a content is, is AI generated. And so we had that a years ago with doorway pages. I miss that, you know, we would create thousands and thousands of doorway pages. And how long would it be until Google figured out, you know, that these are doorway pages and just um, and just ignored them or give a penalty if, or something like that if, if you have too many doorway pages? You know, I think there's a time and place um, for using AI. And I think that, you know, if if you are creating a site and your articles and content are all AI generated, you know, then then, uh, that's probably something you probably shouldn't do unless you're just, you know, creating articles or content for another site or or something like that. But on your main site, um, I generally speak, you know, you take a hard, long look at, you know, how much... AI generated content is is used. Now, it can actually be very helpful 
if you have 100,000 products on your e-commerce site and you kind of need some descriptions and, you know, you need uh, product descriptions and you need, you know, meta description tags and you need, uh, you know, um, a few sentences. Now that can be, you know, that could actually be very useful uh, for product descriptions, you know, yellow shirt versus blue shirt versus, you know, and as just to, you know, rewrite and, and, and to, you know, generate those. Yeah, absolutely. And also if all the uh, other competitors out there are just using RS, standard RSS feeds with the same product names and the same product descriptions, if you can use AI to change the way that that is written, then that would add additional value in the eyes of search engines. Yes, definitely. I mean, it would help the user, it would help and so forth. You know, it, it not only just search it. So I think that what we shouldn't, as SEOs, we should not do is basically is you know not rely too much on AI-generated content. Use it... Um, you know, uh, sparingly and you know, pro- you know, when when appropriate. That's a great, thoughtful piece of advice there. Um, the way you were talking about AI-driven content um, kind of reminded me of article spinning back in the day as well. But um, AI content's obviously better than that, but it's still probably not quite at the stage where it can replace humans. And um, certainly for your more important pages, your product pages, your highly converting pages, get high quality human content on there. Bill Hartzer is CEO at Hartzer Consulting, and you can find him over at hartzer.com. Bill, thanks so much for being on SEO in 2023. Great. Great to be here. Get your copy of SEO in 2023, the book, over at seoin2023.com.